Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Hoffman of Saybrook University. This video is a brief introduction and orientation to the Foundations of Existential Humanistic and Transpersonal Psychology course at Saybrook University. What I'm going to cover in this is a brief overview uh, and approach to the course, and then I'll talk some about course discussions, the writing assignments and utilizing feedback, the assignment quizzes, and ways to succeed in this course. So the overview of this course. First, it's to provide a, a broad introduction to existential humanistic and transpersonal uh, psychology. This is the foundations course for the existential humanistic and transpersonal psychology specialization. However, it's also open to other students at the university that may just want to get some background into these different areas. The hope is that it will provide a foundation to your studies at Saybrook so that you can go more in depth into the existential humanistic and transpersonal psychologies based on this foundation. Now, another aspect of this is to introduce you some to Saybrook, Saybrook's faculty, and uh, the history of Saybrook University. Saybrook University has been incredibly influential on existential humanistic and transpersonal psychology, and certainly is one of the most important, if not the most important, school in the development uh, of these approaches to psychology. We continue to have many of the, the leaders uh, the world leaders in existential humanistic and transpersonal psychology teaching at Saybrook and in particular in the specialization. This is a part of the history that uh, I'm particularly proud of and I think our specialization is particularly proud of and we want to make sure to preserve and maintain. So we take great pride um, in some of this legacy. So in this course one of the things that uh, I'm doing is adding a lot of videos that you can watch. Some of these will be required videos and then some will be optional videos for you to uh, to watch. These will typically be by individuals that are on Saybrook's faculty, particularly in the EHTP program, or that are Saybrook alumni and others. So it'll give you an opportunity to get to know some of the people at Saybrook and who have been at Saybrook. With the optional videos, I really encourage you to look through and see which ones may be of interest to you. This may help you identify faculty members that you want to work with, take courses with, or consider for your uh, master's thesis committee or your doctoral essays and dissertation committee. With the course discussions, let me give a, a bit of a framework for these. First, my strong encouragement is to not treat them as busy work. I'm not a big fan of busy work in classes, that there's always an, a purpose, something you're trying to accomplish with assignments that have. In the course discussions, what I'm really hoping to do is simulate a classroom discussion and provide a space for, where students can play around with ideas. In other words, I don't expect for all of the ideas that you two, that you share and discuss to be your final opinions on ideas, or even to be sure if you agree with what you're saying. Good scholars often change their mind. And they change their mind through considering ideas from different perspectives, playing with them, putting out ideas that maybe aren't fully formed yet, and getting feedback on them. This is a place to do that. So if you put out an idea that you later disagree with, that's not going to be held against you at all. Matter of fact, it's something that I appreciate and respect when students are, are able to do that because that helps you think through your ideas. Hopefully then by the time you're writing your papers, you have thought through the ideas and you can put them down in a more well thought through, supported approach. Because uh, it's intended to simulate a classroom discussion, discussion you can write in a form, more informal style. You still want to use professional communication skills just like you would in a class, such as disagreeing appropriately, being respectful in your communication, and you also want to be sure and show critical thinking skills. But you do not need to cite your sources in APA style. You do in your papers, but not in the classroom discussions. So if you're referring to uh, a chapter in the textbook for, by Schneider, you can just say in the, the chapter by Schneider in the text. That's plenty sufficient for us to identify where it's coming from in a more informal style. If you're referring to a journal article that you read outside, or even just an idea that you, you don't even remember where it's come from, um, that, that you remember reading, you can state it just in that way, that in an article that I read preparing for my paper, or an article I read for another class, I don't remember who the author was or what the title was. So you're giving credit for the ideas, but you're not doing it in a formal way, just like you wouldn't necessarily do it in a formal way in a classroom discussion. 
Now, the most frequent mistake that students make in the classroom discussion is summarizing. When I ask students to um, rewrite posts or to um, go into more depth or to make changes for future posts, 90% of the time it's about summarizing. The other 10% it's, it's generally about going into more depth and using critical thinking skills a little bit more. And on rare occasions it might be about uh, communicating in a more appropriate manner. But hopefully you've got it down by the time you're in graduate school to communicate in a respectful, appropriate uh, manner. But, so most of the feedback that I give is please don't summarize or please go into greater depth. But in particular, to not summarize. So make sure to avoid that in your post. That will save you time and it will also make your contributions much more valuable. But do demonstrate that you've done the reading. You can do this without summarizing by engaging it, by applying it. So you might say, you know, I really like this idea by Schneider. But then you don't go on and summarize it. You say, I like this idea by Schneider. This is a place where I might apply it. Or I like this idea by Schneider, but here's some limitations that I see in it. Again, you don't summarize. You just introduce the idea just enough so that we know what you're talking about. And you can always assume that everyone's doing the required reading and is familiar with it. So we don't need to hear it again. Just refer to it enough, and then talk about how you'd apply it, how you'd critique it, how you'd compare it to a different theory, how it's similar to someone's ideas or different from someone's ideas. All these things are ways that you can show that you've done the reading without summarizing. Do make sure that you engage with others as well. And there's many reasons why we do this. One, it helps us get different perspectives on topics, which is really important. That deepens your understanding deepens your grasp and also helps you recognize the, rec the limitations and potential of certain ideas. But also when we read, we often forget. When we read and discuss, we're more likely to remember ideas. So this deepens our uh, understanding of what we're reading. It helps it be more likely that we're going to remember it. And then one thing that is key is do not fall behind. You cannot engage and interact with others, which is a requirement for passing this course. You cannot engage and interact with others if you are consistently late on your assignments. The discussions will close shortly after the week is closed. So if you do not, I generally keep it open to Wednesday because afterwards, after it's due, because life does happen sometime. That gives you a couple of extra days if something does happen. But if you don't have your discussion post completed on time, you should do a couple of things. One, you should email me. It's professional courtesy if you're going to be late on something to let the instructor know. If you are late, uh, particularly a couple times, and not informing me about it, well, that's going to count against you and potentially limit your ability to pass the course. Uh, two, if you do post one lately, then you need to make sure you're not letting that be a pattern. If you fall behind regularly, even if you get it done by the time the participation is closed, but if you're regularly behind, you're not going to be able to meet the requirements of engaging and interacting with others adequately, and you will not pass the course. So don't fall behind. Very important. Now, my participation is going to, to vary. I don't respond to every post. Um, what I hope is that you're responding and interacting a lot with each other. There'll be times where I jump in and respond to posts. I will post some things at the beginning of the week. Uh, some summary posts where uh, summarizing and connecting into different things. What I often do is if ideas come up where I think you might really want to make sure to, to read or be aware of someone, I might post some things along those lines. So if you're not, if you're finding that I'm not responding to all your posts, don't worry about that. I do read every post, but I don't respond to every post. Just like I hope you read every post, but do not necessarily respond to every post. My strong suggestion is watch the video on critical thinking in the classroom discussion that's available in the course shell if you have not already watched this. Okay, writing assignments and utilizing feedback. Communication is absolutely essential for psychologists. If you're going to be in this field, you need to be able to communicate well, including communicating in writing. If you can communicate well in writing, that's going to do a lot to advance your career. If you are not able to do this in a, in a good manner, it's probably going to hold you back. And it's good to learn to write in a couple of different styles. That's why in, there are different styles of writing that will be expected in different assignments throughout the program and even within this course. 
It's a different type of, of writing and communicating, but yet a professional style that's wanted in the discussions as compared to what's expected in the, um, uh, the scholarly papers for this course. It's also essential for a PhD when you get, to, if you're, as well as a master's, if you're going to write a master's thesis or a, a dissertation, you must be able to write well. If you don't have, are you able to do that, you're not going to have much fun on your PhD and you may not be able to complete your dissertation. So my goal is to help you improve your writing so you can focus more on content. And there are students at times that come into programs and because they struggle with writing, they spend a good portion of the time learning scholarly writing and good critical thinking skills. Because they're focusing so much on that, they're not able to focus as much on the content. So the more you can master these skills, the more you can focus on the content, and the more your instructors are able to focus on the content and giving you feedback on the content instead of the quality of your writing. It helps you, my goal is also to help you improve your writing to save time over the course of the program. If you're constantly having to go and look things up in the manual because you're not learning these foundations or to look up how to do things appropriately in grammar, to get people to, to proofread for you and rewrite or rewriting papers. As we do often at Saybrook, ask people to rewrite papers. That's part of our pedagogy. Most students will be asked to do that at least a few times throughout the program. But as your writing gets stronger, it's less likely you'll be asked to do that. So you're going to save yourself a lot of time if you can master the, the, the basic foundations of good scholarly writing. Also, my goal is to help you improve your writing so that your dissertation will not be as painful as it might be. Uh, there are people that I've worked with that their dissertation has been extended by a semester or more, largely because <clears throat> they struggled with writing skills. Get those writing skills down and you won't have to work about that. And also my goal is to help you improve your writing so that your writing can help you succeed in your career goals. Each writing assignment should demonstrate improvement on writing and critical thinking. In this class, there's two papers that you'll write. In that second paper, it is a requirement that you utilize feedback from the first paper to make improvements on the second. If I see even small mistakes that were uh, mentioned in the first paper that are not being corrected, even small API style mistakes, as soon as I recognize those, I'm going to send the paper back and say you did not utilize the feedback. Please revise the paper, utilizing the feedback, and then I will grade it. If I take the time to give you feedback to help you succeed in the program and career, and you're not utilizing it, that's not respecting my time. And I do expect that you respect my time as I try to respect your time by helping you to improve your writing so that you can save time and be more successful all the time. All written assignments, except for course discussions, should use a scholarly style of writing. So journal articles are a good model for this. And you can write in a scholarly style, even if you're writing about your personal opinion. Um, you, there's, it, you'll see this in a lot of theory articles and journey articles where they're advocating for a position. So you want to really work to write in as much of that consistent scholarly tone as you can. My suggestion, there are several videos on um, how to write well, my books to grading and such in the classroom uh, online, the canvas shell. And I would encourage you to watch those, particularly if you've not had a class with me before or if you've not watched those videos previously. The assignment quizzes. This is something I'm doing that is somewhat new um, that helps students succeed. What I'm finding is everyone's busy. It's easy to at times forget uh, to go in and look through the feedback and to look through it in a way that's really going to help you remember it. So what I have done is created some assignment quizzes where you're basically going to be asked what are some of the aspects of the feedback that you really believe you need to focus on for your next papers. And you'll be asked to do this with each paper that you write for this course. It's just looking through the feedback. It should not take very long. You're just putting down what is the feedback. If you write an exceptionally good paper, I may waive this assignment and just say you do not need to do this assignment because you did it an exceptional job in writing for the paper. The purpose of this is to really help reinforce the learning. When you get the feedback and you, you just check it off but you don't pay close attention to it, then you're likely to continue to repeat those mistakes. If you reflect on it a little bit and write out, these are the things that I probably need to work on the most, then you're more likely to remember it. 
I do something similar all the time with my writing. Even though I've published quite a bit and served in many editor roles, uh, there still are ways I'm constantly working to improve my writing. And there normally are somewhere between three and five things that I'm doing that I'm trying to, each time I write a paper, after I get done, I'm going back through and looking for this particular mistake so that I can correct it. As I continue to do that, I continue to constantly improve my writing. So this is what I'm hoping you will do with this, is to, based on the feedback, identify what are the three to five things that I really need to focus on in improving, improving my own writing. So how to succeed in the course, I basically covered this. One, keep up with the assignments. Very important. Um, with the written papers, I schedule when written papers are due across the classes that I teach so that they're not all due at the same time. I grade by IQ in the order things come in. If you are late on your assignment, it may fall further back in the queue, take longer for you to get the feedback, which means it's more difficult for you to um, complete the course on time, more difficult for you to utilize the feedback to make improvements upon your next assignment, all of these different things. Also, one of the things that to, to be very honest about is when assignments are late, this is one of the, the most common things that cuts into professors' time. For many of us teaching, when assignments are late, um, because we do structure out how our time for things, when assignments are late, it often means that we have to take out from our family, time from our family, time from our own self-care, and other things like this to be grading things because students were not um, keeping up with their coursework. So it's being respectful of the instructor's time to make sure that you're keeping up with requirements, and if ever something comes up that you're going to be late, you let the instructor know as soon as possible. The instructor should never find out an assignment is late uh, from going in and seeing it's not submitted. It should always come directly from you, uh, except in very unusual circumstances. Ask questions. If something's not clear in the syllabus, in the course shell, um, there's often one or two little errors in the course shell that I'm going to miss updating several classes each semester. And so if there's things that are little errors there, ask questions and get these clarified. If you're not clear on feedback that I give you, um, ask questions by email or email me and say, can we have a time to talk through the feedback? Utilize the feedback as I've talked about and watch those recommended videos. If you do these things, I think you're likely to succeed in this course. If you continue to apply these things, I think you're going to be much more successful in graduate school in general.